Jack Emil and Michael Begler, as writers of the hospital drama The Nick, what's your background in medicine? I've been patients a lot of times. <laughs> exactly. We, we really don't have any uh, uh, background. Um, we have, I mean, we, n n neither of us went to school for it. It's just more of a, <clears throat> of a fascination than anything. Yeah, I think um, for us, I think for us it was it was coming at it as lay people originally with no preconceived notions of what medicine was supposed to be and, and, and what a medical professional was supposed to be and not knowing the history of medicine, coming in and being able to to discover it with fresh eyes. I think we're, that actually helps us bring it to the audience as sort of presenters of this era, this time, this medicine and these attitudes. Okay, so you've set the drama in 1900, and what surprised you most about what has actually not changed since then? You know, it's how far we've come from then, and but it's really what 100 years from now, we're gonna look back the same way we look back at 1900. You know, that we're gonna say, you know, we're, we're looking at the show, and people are looking at the show like, oh my God, they used to take turpentine to help with intestinal problems. Well, we're gonna look back and go like, oh my God, wait, what was chemotherapy? You, you poisoned the body? For, to, to get rid of cancer. So I think to me that was always a really, it, it to me is what, what when, you, when you ask that question, like sort of what always strikes me. Humanity and inhumanity are still things that shock us and surprise us. I think that, you know, there are moments of inhumanity in, in the world that we all get shocked by and say, oh my gosh, you know, why, why does this exist? And I think in the same way, there are moments of great kindness that happen where you go, oh my, wow, that, that's lovely. And I think 1900 had the same thing. And maybe the inhumanity was a little more brutal and there was a little less political correctness. But to me, that is part of what, what is universal about this. But also, because the show is so much about privilege and about um, the presumption of, of, of how entitled you are or the, the assumption of the, a group being less entitled, um, you look and you realize not that much has changed in terms of the entitled classes. Maybe the people within the class have changed a bit, but also a lot of the people who are in the unentitled classes um, has stayed the same. So I understand that the first season was picked up, written, and shot over a period of about five or six months. So mm -hmm. HBO shows, they normally take years to develop. Why do you think they're so eager with yours? We just really had a window in which we could, we could actually pull this off. So, um, and I don't think any of us really thought that we could because it was such a small window. You know, we, um, we got the green light at the end of May of 2013 and we started shooting in September. So we only had a pilot at that point. We had to write nine more. Um, and not only that, they had to put together, they had to build the thing. They had to, they had to create all the wardrobe. We had to cast over 170 speaking parts. So it was quite an undertaking. Um, but, but I think um, there was a lot of just momentum because of some of the parties involved. Yeah, I think really there was an excitement. Steven has done so much great work, and Clive has done so much great work, and the idea that they would combine on something like this. And, and I think it was also, we'd never seen this. <laughs> we'd never seen 1900, and I think what Michael and I liked about it was it was such an empty playing field because, you know, Gangs of New York was 35 years earlier, and, and Downton Abbey was sort of 20 years later, and, and, and uh, Boardwalk Empire is 20-something years later. So... For us, we had this sort of playing field where we, we really hadn't seen it on TV. And I think that was something that, that appealed, I think, to the network. One question that I always hear writers getting asked is, like, what kind of course correction were you able to do, maybe based on an audience response or based on how the actors were playing something? But you guys actually wrote uh, the first season before you shot any of it. How did you respond to anything that you wanted to change? You know, you kind of write a, you write a draft for sort of everybody, for the departments to make sure they know exactly what you want from the scene and for, you know, the, the actors to know all of your intentions that you meant as a writer in the scene and for the network to really get it. And then what happens is as you get closer to shooting it, what we would keep doing was cutting it back and cutting it back, cutting it back because so much of what the scene, that put played in the scene is what Steven was gonna do with the camera and what the actors were gonna do. And so, and, and the more we knew the characters, the, the less we needed to say in a particular situation. So if anything, the course correction we made was that leading up until we'd written it all, but leading up until we did a lot of changes um, last season to trim everything back or to nuance it in a different way 
capturing maybe an actor's ability to do something with his eyes or uh, another actress with silence, you know, that, that I know that her silence, we, we look at it and say, well, she doesn't say anything and we'll know. And that's a really great thing for a writer. And, uh, you know, usually we fall in love with our words like I am right now with this soliloquy. But um, the truth is, I think that we're the happiest when we're cutting words. You do have a lot of speaking roles and it's a huge production, but I also feel like it's a very small production kind of behind the scenes where Steven Stoderberg is taking on many different roles. And in the writer's room, it's pretty much just you two. And you do have a third writer, Stephen Katz. So I'm wondering, what does he bring to the Nick? Stephen is, 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 is sort of this fascinating man out of time um, who, see, who I think would have done very well in 1900. Um, and he really does know about anything debauched mm -hmm. in 1900, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think he brought a lot of little, little bits of flavor that um, – to, to things like, for example, um, you know, the, how, how um, Ping Wu mentions this thing called the golden lotus and how it's about, you know, and, and about putting the foot in the mouth and, uh, while, while having sex. That's, that's purely a Stephen Katz thing. I mean, that, that's like, that's like right in his sweet spot. You know, those little things were always so, um, were, were such these golden nuggets that he could sort of pop and bring in at any point. And he wrote two of the episodes. So you guys have an extensive background uh, in comedy. And The Nick, I feel, is actually a very funny show, but it kind of sneaks up on you. Like Clive Owen has a lot of one-liners that he says very dryly. So I'm wondering, how do you decide to insert comedy, and why is it important? Um, I feel, and I think we all feel, that the best shows out there can breathe. So you can have a really intense scene, but for the audience, it's like you got to give them something to sort of sit back for a second. And so, and, and I think also that comedy is just part of life. You know, I don't think that everything is so dire and so serious at any, any point and that, that we all can find the absurdity in, in any situation. So I think it's just sort of organically finds its way in. I don't think, I don't think we're ever, as the writers, I don't think we're ever sort of stretching to find those moments, you know, where it's like in a sitcom, like, okay, we're looking for a joke here, looking for a joke here. I think it just sort of plays naturally into who the characters are. Yeah, there are so many wonderful ironies of the of the era and, and, and how people think, and and that for us has been really great because you can you can play absurdities, and I think it also breaks down the wall between the uh, between the the show and the audience when you realize that people in such a dark time were still funny. Remember, they still had vaudeville and they still had comedians and they still had humorists and they still had humorous writers and Mark Twain and you know so I think for us it it allows you to say no no they're just because it's very easy to go oh it's 1900 it's nothing like us truth is they're exactly like us and we're very very close and so they're they're sad they're happy they're self-involved they're silly they're selfless they're funny and the more you can show that the less people can use that distance to say oh no no it's not like that's not who we are uh, what can you tell us about the second season that's coming up this fall? Um, you know, a lot of it took place in the hospital first season. We're really out in the city this year. We really sort of, the city becomes more of a character in a sense um, in second season uh, in a good way. And, and of course, we, you know, we, we, we set the bar high for ourselves last year in terms of like the types of surgeries we did. And we had to up the ante this year, and so. But I think I, I feel confident in saying that I think uh, we've got some we've got some pretty good surgeries coming up. Yeah, I think we the show gets bigger and smaller at the same time because we're going to really cool places and we're shooting on massive vistas and and it's just getting bigger and cooler and we're out on location. I mean, we are so grateful that HBO gives us the ability to you know to afford to go and make the show you know, what, what we want it to be. And at the same time as it's getting bigger, we're getting more intimate with their stories and we're learning more and more about, the, about our characters and we're digging deeper. And so that's been really gratifying is that we're being given a bigger canvas and then being able to paint with a finer brush has been, I don't know, it's just been, I feel incredibly lucky. And I think, I think we're just so grateful um, every day to come to work and to see all these people put it all together for us. And... And we just sit back and go, wow. Thanks very much for talking to me, Michael and Jack. And we wish you the best of luck at the Emmys and on the second season of The Nick. Thank you. Thank you.